yes you know yeah if you can all just pray that nothing more will happen to this recording we will be able to proceed with our class smoothly without any issues um so uh, we'll get started so uh, last class in fact we were touching upon the rather important topic of overcoming the devil and uh, we started off by looking at how uh, important it is for us to understand that he is just a defeated enemy uh, that the victory against him has already been won on the cross and uh, so when we take our stand knowing this truth uh, to a great extent you know we are able to live in um, in victory on a daily basis uh, cancelling his works overcoming him through the uh, victory of uh, on the cross you know we we use the term overcoming by the blood of the lamb now that just basically means overcoming through the finished work of the cross uh, so uh, we are able to do this uh, when we are aware of our uh, legal status now that we are participants in Jesus victory on the cross so whatever he has done for us on our behalf we can claim it and we can live in that uh, so we looked at some points um, because of the you know because of our um, of our new status of victory uh, of being victors in Christ Jesus uh, we looked at certain points that uh, we can use in overcoming the devil so we looked at how he tries to play mind games he tries to accuse he tries to deceive um, he, uh, he uh, also tries to you know um, violate uh, through various uh, different kinds of intrusions and so we looked at how we can guard ourselves protect ourselves in in different uh, ways most of this will be you know in our video last time's video uh, so you can always go back and refer to that uh, so we looked at all of these things um, and uh, the last point in your notes uh, you know regarding this is the use of spiritual weapons uh, we could not touch upon this particular point so we will look at that now um, and then we will get into the last chapter all right so um, just coming to the um, spiritual weapons that are available we are of course very familiar with the Ephesians uh, you know chapter 6 passage uh, so that of course will be you will be covering in greater detail in the third year uh, when um, Ephesians is being covered. Uh, so we will not look at each piece of armor and look at the significance of that uh, right now. But, you know, just to look at that particular verse, which talks about the importance of the armor of God, uh, maybe we could have one person actually read out that particular verse uh, for us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Yeah, someone could read out, please. Ephesians 6, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil, then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Uh, yes. So it talks about how we should put on the full armor of God, because uh, when the day of evil comes, we will be able to stand our ground. So we can never anticipate exactly when this day of evil will come. You know, trials and difficulties and uh, uh, attacks from the evil one can come at any time. We, we will not know beforehand. So it is good for us to always stay, uh, you know, with that entire armor, you know, uh, um, clothe always in that entire armor of God. It says over here, full armor of God. So that when that day comes, when that unanticipated day comes, when the day of evil comes, we will be able to stand our ground. And it also goes on to say, after you have done everything to stand, you know, to remain standing uh, throughout the entire attack and then come out victorious. Uh, so we cannot anticipate beforehand when temptation will strike when uh, satan will try to deceive us and lead us away so if we are always clothed in the armor of god uh, we will be able to stand our ground rather than being swayed by the devil 
rather than you know, be beginning to doubt the truth in God's word because of the lies that he is, you know, the, the half truths that he is speaking, uh, rather than being swayed by all of that, because we are already clothed in the armor, we will be able to withstand and um, uh, the evil one will not give up immediately. You know, the attack may go on for um, hours, you know, where we will where we will feel that, you oh, know, it's all right. No, I can compromise this once and um, it's all right. And you may think all those thoughts, but you choose to continue resisting because you are clothed in the armor of God and having done everything. And finally, the attack stops. You'll still be there standing victorious, not having given in, you know, the, just like Jesus in the wilderness. Yeah, the attack, we do not know for how many days it went on, for how many hours it went on. We do not know the details. But at the end of it all, he, after Satan left, he was still there standing in victory. Jesus did not fall. And now because he is our representative and all that he achieved, uh, we can now have through him if we, you know, uh, continue to walk in the spirit and are not led by the flesh, then we also can have that same uh, victory in and through him. And uh, so even as we talk about the importance of always putting on the full armor of God, um, maybe we can just think of it mainly as three uh, primary points. One, of course, will obviously be uh, standing on the truth of God's word. Whatever God says about us, whatever God says about our future, whatever God says about our calling, we just hold on to that very, very stubbornly. No matter what circumstances are coming our way, no matter what attacks the evil one is you know, launching against us, we just choose to hold on to the truth of what is given in God's word. That becomes one very, very important part of the armor. The other thing is, uh, you know, complete trust in Jesus. I mean, even when it looks like as if it looks, you know, just I mean, um, it's not the truth, but it looks like as if Jesus you know, has just stepped back and is not intervening and is choosing not to help. Or in fact, it may look like as if Jesus has turned against us and is allowing all kinds of negative things to be done to us. It, even when it looks like that, we just place our faith in him and say, I refuse to stop trusting him. You know, so when we can trust him to that level, when we are that um, confident about his faithfulness, about his character, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so uh, the same way he was faithful to us yesterday, even though today things are negative, we have to continue believing that even today, yes, he, even in the midst of all of this, he is still faithful. So the second really important part of the armor uh, is, you know, just refusing to stop trusting him, refusing to stop believing in his goodness, in his power um, and authority over everything that's going on in our lives, just refusing to, you know, um, uh, to stop believing that he will bring us through it all, you know. So uh, that becomes a very important part of the armor. Uh, the third thing, of course, is maintaining righteousness in our lives. That also really helps because, you know, if you remember in Ephesians 6, it's basically the, 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 uh, the it's called the breastplate of righteousness. And, um, uh, you know, like you will see it in, 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 um, you know, during the study that we would do next year when you're having your Ephesians, that uh, the breastplate is not just something that that which covers the you know the, the chest portion. Um, in those days, when they said breastplate, they literally just meant you know two uh, really thick um, you know uh, leather and metal uh, pieces which would hang you know right in, in the in the front and at the back. It's like just basically two large um, pieces of um, leather and um, you know framed with um, metal uh, so the front portion would be uh, you know hanging down all the way up to below your knees so it's not just breastplate it's like hanging right up to uh, below your knees and then the back portion also would be hanging so you would, you would basically have these two pieces held together by some you know leather thongs so uh, the, the the two the back the front piece and the back piece are tied together over here on your shoulders and so this thing just hangs off your body and covers you all the way right down to below your knee uh, so which means um it is shielding all of you so 
maintaining righteousness in our lives really goes a long way in protecting us and shielding us against uh, you know the works of the evil one so these three things i think probably would be very helpful for us as believers to stand our ground you know so even though satan is trying to doubt, make us doubt the god's word we say no we choose to believe that god's word is the truth and then when he tries to attack us uh, in the area of uh, trusting the love of jesus you know he he makes us doubt uh, the authority and power of jesus you know where we think oh my this this situation is so impossible not even god can overcome it is what you know is there is the wrong thought that comes into our minds so um, so believing in the truth of god's word complete faith in jesus and uh, righteousness maintaining righteousness in our lives these three things go a long way in helping us to stand our ground uh, so that would be one main uh, you know uh, spiritual weapon the armor that god has given us the spiritual armor that he has given us um looking to the next thing the anointing of the holy spirit that makes such a difference um when when the devil works against us when he attacks us in different ways um if we have the anointing the enabling the equipping of the holy spirit that makes it easier for us to overcome whatever it is that the, that the devil is trying to unleash against us um, and that's what we see even regarding the life of jesus um acts 1038 i mean i know it's a familiar scripture but then if we could have one uh, you know any one person read out acts 1038 please Acts chapter 10, verse 12. You know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. It's made very, very clear that when Jesus was on this earth, he chose not to use his divine powers so that he can be fully human. and be able to represent us so if he had used his divine powers then he would no longer be human the way we are you know utterly helpless utterly human you know it's what we are and so he chose to be like us he chose not to make use of his divinity in any way while he was operating on the earth and so it says over here that it was god who anointed jesus of nazareth uh he anointed him with the holy spirit and power so that he would be able to go around doing good and it says healing everyone who is who was under the power of the devil so when the devil uses whatever temporary authority you know that has been given to him when he tries to use that against us and against our ministry against our families when he tries to do those things we are able to stand in the strength of the holy spirit the guidance which he gives uh, the power which he releases into our situations we stand upon those things and we are able to overcome the works of the evil one uh, and we are able to do this because the holy spirit is there who has been given to us we have been anointed with uh, with his anointing and it says over here because god was with him so all of god the entire um you know the triune godhead is with us through the holy spirit you know in in the form of the holy spirit so the anointing that is there upon us that is adequate to take take care of every kind of situation uh, so the anointing of the holy spirit does not just simply help us to maybe you know um, share the salvation message or you know preach from the pulpit or uh, you know maybe um, uh, you know heal and deliver someone uh, the holy spirit uh, the anointing of the holy spirit enables us to do these things but the anointing of the holy spirit also helps us to do um, much more than that every work of the devil which is which comes against us can be overcome through this anointing so it's not just a limited anointing which can only help us in some areas of life this is an anointing that can help us to uh, overcome in all areas of our lives and we see that in 
um, Luke 10, 19. Um, if someone can read out for us, Luke 10, 19. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. It says that we have been given authority to overcome all of the power of the enemy. OK, so um, in Acts 10.38, we saw the, uh, you know, the, the, the anointing of, of, of the Holy Spirit um, being released to heal people. So that's the only you know, aspect of, um, uh, of the anointing that is mentioned over there. But here in Luke 10, 19, we see that the anointing of the Holy Spirit doesn't just apply to healing alone. It says that we, are, you know, we have been given this anointing and we have been given this authority to overcome all of the power of the enemy. So it can be a personal attack against us and our family, and we will be able to overcome it. It may be an attack against our church you know, the church where we are ministering, then, you know, in that, even in that, we can come against the works of the evil one. And like we saw in last time's class, we declare, we stand on the word of God, we stand on what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, what he has accomplished. We stand upon that in confident faith. And we say, in Jesus' name, we cancel your works, evil one. <laughs> because uh, what Jesus did on the cross, that work, will obviously always prevail over the temporary works which Satan is trying to do, you know, the temporary works of harm which Satan is trying to do in our situations. So we can boldly stand on the finished work and declare that either, you know, evil one, your works are cancelled because his work, God's work, Jesus Christ's work will prevail over your temporary works. So we can cancel whatever he's trying to do in our lives if we have understood uh, the, you know, what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. Um, another weapon that is mentioned in your notes is the weapon of praise and worship. Um, and I know we are very familiar with this, you know, the, the main example that's always used uh, with regard to praise and worship. Uh, we will look at those few verses, but then, you know, let's also look at the larger implications of that of those two verses uh acts 16 25 and 26 if we can have someone read out please acts 16 25 and 26 acts chapter 16 verse 35 and 26 I am with night fall and time and with praying him to God. And other sinners were listed. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the heaven was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately opened, and the shakes of every system is similar. Yeah, I mean, um, this is a rather interesting passage. Uh, because we see that Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, uh, which basically means that, you know, they have lo not lost hope uh, just because they have been thrown into prison. And now it looks like as if, you know, the ministry is going to kind of be uh, restricted. Uh, they're not concerned about these things. They are praying and, you know, praying with confidence. Uh, knowing that God will hear their prayers and answer them. So with that with that kind of a confidence, they are praying. And so their praying is leading into singing hymns uh, um, to God. You know, so it's like confident prayer. Prayer which is so confident that it ends up in, with, in praise um, uh, because you're very, very sure that God will answer what you are asking for. So they are, uh, they are seated over here praying and singing. And uh, it says the other prisoners were listening to them. What a contrast, you know, between uh, the outlook on life, which all the other prisoners must have been having, and the outlook on life, which these two men have. You know, the others are sitting over there and thinking, OK, this is my life. This is all I ever will have. But here are Paul and Silas knowing that there's much more awaiting them. There's a greater purpose for their lives than just being imprisoned. Um, you know, um, they know that 
uh, God has taken hold of them and given them a calling. And uh, so they will be able to accomplish things for God, uh, whether it is in prison or outside prison. So they are very sure of that. So there's no sense of um, lack of purpose. There's no meaninglessness in their lives, you know, in Paul and Silas' life. So the other prisoners are listening to them and wondering, what are they so hopeful about? What are they so excited about? What is it that they have which we do not have? So they're all listening over there. And then it says this, there was a violent earthquake. And it says the foundations of the prison were shaken. So it was a rather violent earthquake. And obviously, because of the earthquake, I know the prison doors fly open. Um, and then it says everyone's chains came loose. You know, now, an earthquake can cause doors to open. We could say, OK, fine, you know, maybe the locks in those days were not very not very good, not the kind of technology that we have today. So yes, maybe the prison doors flew open. But one thing, you know, earthquakes don't exactly make chains on your hands fall off, right? Uh, so we see something divine happening over here in answer to the, you know, the prayers of these people. And they are praying with confidence, singing hymns, say, knowing that God will hear and answer. So I'm just kind of, you know, thinking maybe there's more to this passage than just, you know, the, the just the physical release of um, Paul and Silas from jail. Maybe there's something more happening over here because that not only do the, do the shackles fall off, you know, not only do the chains fall off from the hands of Paul and Silas, the chains fall off from all the other people's hands as well. It very clearly says that at once all the prison doors flew open, not just the jail cell where Paul and Silas are being placed. All, all the prison doors fly open. Everyone's chains come loose. So I'm just thinking, if we really pray with confidence you know, before uh, our God, fully understanding what he has done for us on the cross, you know, fully understanding the love that he has for people, and the deep desire that he has to deliver people from their sins and the things which are holding them down. If we really pray with confidence, um, with sing, you know, with singing, because we are so confident the Lord will do it. If we are praying with that kind of an attitude, it looks like as if chains which are you know holding people down would be released. So you see, we are not just overcoming the devil's work in our own lives. We are able to overcome the devil's work in the lives of our congregation, in the lives of the people that we are trying to minister to, you know, in the lives of the of, the, of that little prayer group that you are leading. The chains of the things which are binding them can be broken if you are praying in confidence and you're you're, you're praying with singing, knowing that your God is in charge and that your God has already won the victory. So I think the way we do it is so powerful. Not only can it just set us free, it can set even the other people that we are ministering to, even they can be set free um, through our praise and prayer and worship. You know, So um, um, sometimes when we are you know, ministering to people, I mean, we may be in full-time ministry, or we may just you know, having, have a secular job, and we are serving Christ wherever we can. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether we are, whether we are full time, part time, or, or you know in, in what capacity we are serving the Lord. When we are serving the Lord, we keep coming across so many people and their needs. You know, some of them have such great needs, and we think, oh my, will my little prayer really make a difference? You know, with this huge crisis that this family is facing, and we feel sometimes so helpless. So at such times, I think it really helps for us uh, to remember that our God cares deeply about each of us, and that you know it says like right, right like it says right in Matthew chapter one itself, He came to save people from their sins. So no, no matter what you know the people that we are encountering are going through, you know, we know that our God came to actually help them. You know all the all the all the consequences that we face in this fallen world of sin. He came to deliver people from all of that. So I think we can actually stand in confidence and pray even for the impossible situations that we see, and we can do it with singing. 
knowing that indeed our God is a deliverer. So he will overcome the works of the evil one, which we see happening, you know, in those families that we are praying for, that we are interceding for. Uh, so uh, if we do that with confidence, the chains which are holding them down can actually be broken off. I mean, I, I know I'm taking a historical event that actually took place and I'm adding a spiritual overtone to that. But I mean, um, it seems to make sense uh, because the other prisoners were listening to what is going on. And then they actually, with their own eyes, they got to see the results of what they were listening to. They saw that the prison doors were opened. They saw the chains fall off. And that must have made a lot of them sit up and think, oh my goodness, this must be a living God. You know, so um, uh, I think um, there are lessons that we can learn about prayer and praise and worship and trusting God, you know, from this passage. So uh, prayer, praise, worship, um, the simple faith that we have in the Lord, these things can be powerful weapons against the works of the evil one. The other one, of course, you know, is uh, intercession. Um, Maybe we can look at Acts 12, uh, verses 5 to 7. Yeah, Acts 12, 5 to 7, if someone can read out, please. Acts chapter 12, verses 5 to 7. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed a very earnestly for The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others to God at the present day. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on one side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up, and the chains fell off his face. Over here we see there's a direct connection uh, between the intercession being made by the church members and what happens over here in the prison cell. Uh, so the church is at some other location, but it says that they were earnestly praying to God for Peter. And as a result of their intercession, we see an angel being sent over here to do something extraordinary. And if we read that entire passage, we get to know Peter assumes that everything that is happening is a vision that is just seeing it in, um, in, in the spiritual realm. He doesn't actually realize it's actually it's happening to him in the physical realm itself where he's actually being you know uh, taken out of the prison where he's being led out of the prison he just assumes he's just seeing it in a in a vision and then later he realizes that after he comes out he realizes oh my goodness i'm actually physically in body out of the prison uh, you know so um, so over here even as the church was earnestly praying to the lord uh, god sends forth his angel uh, to do something miraculous. Uh, so a uh, very important weapon that we have with us is uh, you know, intercessory prayer. We can actually use that to defeat whatever um, you know, plans Satan may have against the church, whatever plans Satan may have against the people of God. Uh, so um, intercession uh, can make a very great difference. So um, we looked at various um, various methods that we can use, uh, various uh, you know strategies that we can use to overcome the evil one. We started off by looking at the what has legally already been accomplished, that on the cross Jesus has defeated Satan. So now he will have to use illegal methods of trying to get hold of us, trying to attack us. He cannot just do it outright because we no longer belong to his kingdom. We are no longer under his power. So he has to somehow entice us and somehow you know, deceive us into coming to him and uh, allowing him to harm us. So, uh, so, these, uh, so he tries all kinds of different tactics, tries to make us doubt God, tries to make us, um, you know, um, uh, divided between us, losing our unity. He tries all of these other tactics. And so we saw we saw how we should open the closed doors. We saw how we can use the name of Jesus as a weapon uh, in cancelling the works of the evil one. Uh, we saw uh, the, uh, the the care that we should, uh, we should take regarding submitting to authority in the church so that uh, Satan does not use that 
as an opening uh, to get to gain a foothold. There are so many points that we covered. It's all there in last time's video. Um, uh, so these these were all the things that we saw that we can do to overcome the devil. All right. So um, maybe we can take a slightly you know early break uh, because then we can come back for the last chapter you know with a fresh recording all right so uh, it's now actually 43 uh, so could we all please log back in at 1053 you know, so that then we can get into our final chapter so now it's 1043 we will log back in at 1053 thank you